Well, good morning and welcome to our third and final satsang for the week. It's Thursday morning already. Can you believe how fast the week is going by? It seems like it's just started and here we are. Thursday. But the nice thing about being the third of the satsangs, I think Brother Govindananda pointed out how everybody knew all the answers already for the first one, but now I've had all these classes and other satsangs before, so all I have to do is make references. <laughs> and, and you got it. So, the first of our questions. What are the attitudes and qualities one should cultivate for swift spiritual progress? Which attitudes are conducive and which are detrimental in terms of spiritual advancement based on your experience counseling SRF devotees? Well, I got that question and I realized nobody ever asked me. Um, but I can tell you some answers. And the first... I would suggest, is be willing to change. That's probably the most important feature in how to cultivate swift spiritual progress is a willingness to change, because that's what the whole spiritual path is about, changing from what we are now into what we are to become. And our guru has given us so many incredible conceptualizations through his own experiences that he describes that we can tune in with that. And I'd like us to do that right now at the start of this satsang. Let's just close our eyes as we visualize this imagery of our gurus. So focus there at the point between the eyebrows because this is what Guruji says, if you saw God right now, you would see him as one mass of light scintillating over the whole universe. As I close my eyes in ecstasy, everything melts into that great light. It is not imagination, Rather, the perception of the sole reality of being. And so this light, we can visualize, imagine it. That is what our guru has brought this entire teaching of yoga meditation to help us realize that this is what we really are. And he goes on, he says, in meditation... This darkness of sensory dependence goes away and intuition prevails, revealing oneself as light in the magnitude of a whole universe of light. So that's the ultimate goal. That's what we want to change into. And this realization, when we change ourselves this way, that provides every answer to every problem for everybody, for any time, anywhere. If we know ourselves as light, no problems ever again. And so, this is also how we can solve all of the imperfections of this dismal world we live in. Sometimes it seems like a not very pleasant place. In fact, the Lord Krishna, one image that he expresses this world as being, he says, the world, the earth, is an ocean of affliction. How's that for an image? And yet, Guruji, in his commentary, in the second coming of Christ, he says, even so, even though it's an ocean of affliction, he says, many love it and do not wish to be displaced from its complacent familiarity. We enjoy the world the way it is. But if we can change our consciousness, then we can change the world as well, and realize what is expressed by Omar Khayyam in his 
quatrains, you know, his Rubaiyat, the 73rd one, and these are anybody who has a poetic kind of leaning, I suggest you get the Wine of the Mystic and read those quatrains and our Guru's explanations of what they are. Because number 73, ah, love, could thou and I with fate conspire to grasp this sorry scheme of things entire? Would not we shatter it to bits and then remold it nearer to the heart's desire? So did you get the meaning? Ah, love. Cosmic beloved, divine mother, could you and me with fate, with cosmic law, with laws of karma, could we conspire to grasp the sorry scheme to control this whole ocean of affliction? Would not we then shatter it to bits, blow it up, and then remold it the way it ought to be, near to the heart's desire? Well, we can do that. But, haha, the but, there is a problem because we don't like to change. It's easy to say, we'll just change. No, we want to stay the same. This is what we call it our comfort zone, right? We don't want things that make us change to encroach upon us. It's uncomfortable. And we like the way we are. And so we postpone oftentimes, the things we need to confront in our lives and we just kick it down the road. A little bit later, another incarnation or two. <laughs> and so here we are now, dealing with the things of our past lives, and these are the big life tests, that's what I call them, that now come at us, and so this is what we ministers get to try to answer in songs and counseling, how to deal with this stuff. So the thing though is, even when the problems become so painful that we can't ignore them anymore and we know we've got to do something, well then there's an amazing thing that our minds do. It's the ego's amazing sleight of mind trick. You know about that? You know what sleight of hand is. It's when a magician does this trick and, how did he do that? We just know it's not real. And that's what the ego does when we're confronted with a problem and we turn it around and say, that's because of him that I have this problem, or her, or them, or that. It's not me. That's the sleight of mind trick and it happens instantaneously, and we're not even aware of it unless we're watching. But if the problem is them or that or other, it's not me, and so I'm just a victim. I can't do anything about it. <laughs> so this, I'm just pointing out why change can be difficult. So being willing to change, and this is why this class is so easy, because Brother uh, Sevananda already told you the answer on Tuesday night when he gave you that affirmation. Remember the affirmation? Let's repeat it together. Dear Father, whatever condition confronts me, I know they represent the next step in my unfoldment. I will welcome all tests because I know that within me is the intelligence to understand and the power to overcome. And there it is. The more we realize we created our problems, we created the environments that we're in, then we can begin to effectively deal with whatever it is that we need to change. And then the question is, well, I got all of these issues, how do I know what to do? Well, this is where we tune in with the guru. 
Because Master tells us in all of his writings and his recordings, in the lessons, he gives us the answer to every question of life. And the reason I say it's so important to tune in with Master is that if we're just relying on our own sense, well, I know I need to change now and this is what I need to do, we're still susceptible to that sleight of mind, the ego trick. This is what Master says about that. Some cling so tenaciously to the wrong attitudes and to support themselves, they say, I feel God is guiding me. When delusion is strong, that is when the help of a true guru is so important. And so this is why we recommend study every day something of the guru's writings, his teachings, be in his vibration. He gives us the answers to all these conundrums and questions. But then, going beyond that, we can, then the final part of this formula, being willing to change, taking responsibility, and tuning in with the guru through his writings, then we can go in meditation and deal with this. Whatever condition confronts me, we can determine how to deal with that through this technique. Master gives this in Divine Romance. He said, remember, greater than a million reasonings of the mind is to sit and meditate upon God until you feel calmness within. Then say to the Lord, I can't solve my problem alone, even if I thought a zillion different thoughts. But I can solve it by placing it in your hands. First, by asking for your guidance, and then following through by thinking out the various angles for a possible solution. When your mind is calm and filled with faith after praying to God in meditation, you are able to see various answers to your problems, and you are capable of picking out the best solution. Follow that solution, and you will meet with success. This is applying the science of religion in your daily life. Okay? So after meditation, it's not during meditation that you're thinking about all these things, right? And like Brother Saralananda was telling us, go deep into the silence and then practice the presence. But after all of that, then's the time to look at whatever is confronting you and let the possible solutions just float up in your mind and pick out whatever seems the best because you're now in tune with God's vibration, with the guru, through intuition, and follow that. And this is the way that we can progress most quickly toward this goal of self-realization. Next question. We're often reminded that we are made in the image of God. How does this apply to financial decisions? Frequently, I have doubts whether to be cautious about financial security and play it safe, or have courage enough to take challenges. Please help. Well, I think many of us have financial issues and wonder, well, what do I do? In this particular case, I would suggest you might want to start with the answer to the previous question, which is sitting after meditation and looking at why this is an issue for you. Because within the question, there's a number of factors which I don't have the answers to. Is this about your need to develop courage, for instance? Or is it because you fear not having enough to get by? Or is it because there's others in your environment who you're responsible for, who are dependent on you and your finances are going to affect them? And I don't have those answers. And to answer it for yourself, you need to first understand why it really is an issue. But I can answer this in terms of 
master's concept of abundance. Abundance, Master says, in his autobiography of Yogi, in the last chapter, chapter 49, he says this, it's just a brief two sentences, but it's fabulous. Abundance, material as well as spiritual, is a structural expression of ritka, cosmic law, or natural righteousness. Abundance, having not just enough, but more than enough, it's built into the fabric of the universe itself. Master says, there is no parsimony in the divine, nor in its goddess of phenomena, exuberant nature. And so, by implication, if we are perceiving scarcity in our lives, what that may reflect is that there's a certain attunement with the cosmic order that's not quite in place. And, of course, that's the purpose of the whole spiritual path, is to put ourselves in harmony with the cosmic order of things. And as we do this more and more, these worries about financial conditions and uh, being concerned about scarcity, it gradually transforms as we become more and more aware that God really is in charge and everything is okay in the world. And so what we can do consciously, though, right now for every one of us, in addition to all of our meditation practices, is change your concept of prosperity of success. Master says the, that the typical concept of success focuses on having a lot of money. Well, yeah, right? But he says no. Real success means to have the power to create at will what you truly need. The power to acquire those things that are truly necessary for your absolute existence and happiness. So it's not just subsistence living, but it's whatever you need to be really happy and focus on that. Master says, continuing, it requires a masterful mind and a strong will, a very strong will to live simply. It entails neither hardship nor deprivation, but the wisdom to work for and be content with what you truly need. To spend money on foolish things, even if you have the means to do so, is weakness. Practice self-control and reduce your wants to purposeful necessities and do not live beyond your means. This is the first lesson to learn if you want to be prosperous. Okay? It's an expression of high thinking, and plain living. That's a foundational principle for the spiritual life. And so, for any financial concerns that we may have, there's a very, very practical tool that we have, and it's with every single one of our free literature displays, and it's called the Horn of Plenty Bank. You're familiar with this? You get the little box, it's folded like just flat, and then you, the best part of it is you get to make it into a box. You <laughs> fold the top down, and put this in and do that, and, and then there's a little slot in the top, and every day you take a coin and you put it in the bank as you repeat an affirmation. Teach me to feel that thou art the power behind all wealth and the value within all things. Finding thee first, I will find everything else in thee. This is a miracle tool. It changes consciousness. It has for me anyway. I use this every day. And we've had so many miracle stories come to the Mother Center as a result of people using this little uh, bank. This one devotee writes, Since I've used the Horn of Plenty Saving Plan, 
I've had several bonuses, a switch in positions with pay raise, and, on, and I'm now also subsidy publishing a book. It's been truly amazing and a joy to watch God's power move in my life and change my fleeting hopes and expectations to an entirely new level. And so I say, this is a miracle tool, but it's, there's nothing miraculous about it. All we're doing is putting ourselves in harmony with these cosmic principles of the law of abundance. What we're doing, we're taking a little bit of our abundance and putting it in the box as we mentally, consciously repeat the affirmation, which changes the cells of our brains at a very deep level. And then, when it's full, we give it away. You don't empty it out and use it again. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be that we give it to SRF. You can. It makes the collection baskets kind of heavy. Uh, but, but you can give it to somebody on the street. You can put it in the tip box, the, or the restaurant, whatever. It'll be a surprise to the, uh, to the waiter. But the point is that by sharing with others, we're affirming to the universe and to ourselves there is enough to go around. And that vision becomes our reality. Okay, next question. I met and married my husband before finding the SRF path. He is not supportive and we have not gotten along well for years. He criticizes me often. My reading and the ministers say environment and associates are very important for spiritual development. I live hundreds of miles from an SRF temple. Sometimes I am grateful for the constant thorn to encourage me to think of God and Guru. Sometimes I'm not strong enough to avoid argument, and at times I want to divorce. I am near friends and family who love me, but no other SRF devotees. I meditate with a great group, God, Divine Mother, Guru, and the Masters. Please comment. Well, in light of what we've already been saying, well, yes, environment is really, really important. Master tells us that. But also, what we've said, we have drawn to ourselves the environment, inner and outer, that we live in right now. Not just in this life, but in many, many lifetimes before. And so, Whatever conditions confront me, I know they represent the next step in my unfoldment. And so, we have to be careful that the ego's sleight of mind trick is not making us project this problem onto somebody or something else. And I think all of us, every devotee, does have difficult environmental issues from time to time, perhaps with one other, perhaps with many others, all kinds of situations. But what we need to do first is identify what we can actually control in that domestic situation. What do we have control over? And I'll give you a hint of what we don't have control over, as if you need the hint, it's not your spouse. It's not your children. It's not even your pet fish. <laughs> the only one we have control over is ourselves, right? That's where we start. That's where the change begins. And Brother Anandamoy, anyone who has any kind of relationship issues, marital issues, Read or listen to his talk, Spiritual Marriage. You can download it from the SRF website as an MP3 file. 
But he, in that, he explains a common difficulty, and it's also available as that little How to Live booklet. But he says a common difficulty is that many devotees have already married before they discover the spiritual path. It often happens that the husband or wife is opposed to the teachings and resents the time the other spends in meditation. That is difficult. What to do about it? And then he gives answers. He says there's always time, even a little bit, for meditation. So the first thing is, you don't throw away your spiritual routine and practices, no. You may need to fit that in to the other things you have to do. But he goes on, we must also remember that there are many ways of growing spiritually. One of the most essential is to practice unselfishness, because the ego has to go. That's the last and biggest hurdle. And then he says, I'll give you an illustration. One woman told me, when I came onto the spiritual path, my husband did not want to have anything to do with it and resented that I was trying to meditate. And as a result, I resented him with my whole being. After some time, though, she read something in Master's teaching, so she was studying what Master had said about various things, and she said that what he said hit me like lightning. It opened my eyes, and I realized that because of my negative attitude toward him, I was spending the whole day in resentment. I was so proud that I was a devotee, and he was not. But I realized that with that attitude, I was less spiritual than he. Then I changed, and instead of spending all those hours in resentment, I spent them in practicing the presence and praying for my husband. My life changed, and you wouldn't believe it, but he is changing too. And of course, this is um, the only effective way that we can change others by changing ourselves. And Sri Dayamata takes this same thought but takes it to yet a higher level in her talk, Living a God-Centered Life. She says, when husbands and wives can hand in hand seek God together with that same unconditional love, what wonderful companionship this can be. But if those of you who are married do not yet have that unconditional love for each other, don't be discouraged. It is possible to change others, not by words, but by your own behavior. You can conquer by love. It must be unconditional, though, not the kind that demands, I'll go on giving love provided he or she responds to me as I wish. Don't be overly concerned about another's response. Leave that in God's hands. And so this, on one level, it's a fabulous way to change our environment, to actually change the thoughts, opinions, attitudes, feelings of other people, of that other person who is important in our life. But what we're doing beyond that is learning to give love unconditionally. And remember what the most significant thing in your spiritual advancement is all about, is learning to love God unconditionally. That's the final test of the spiritual life, to be able to unconditionally love God. And this is why we don't get the responses that we would like from the divine because we still have to develop that capacity. But as we're learning to love another individual unconditionally, we're also developing the strength to love God with that same unconditional love. And when we can do that unconditionally, God will respond, guaranteed. 
with his ocean of light, love, and joy. And so now, another question. Sometimes I feel I can never live up to Guruji's expectations. This especially happens when there's a lot going on in my life and I don't have the time and energy to do what he asks of me in terms of spiritual routine. Then, in addition to all my other challenges, are added my feelings of discouragement and guilt. My once treasured sadhana then turns into a heavy obligation. How can I get back the enthusiasm and love and trust that I felt when I first met Guruji? Well, I think this is something that many, many of us can relate to. But we have to understand that the guru does not require anything from any devotee. The guru is giving us unconditional love, regardless of what we do or what we don't do. He's fulfilling his side of the bargain. And there is an unstated preface to every one of our guru's instructions about meditation, about living the spiritual life, and that is if you want to know God. You just put that at the beginning. If you want freedom from all pain and sorrow and suffering forever, follow the Eightfold Path of Yoga. Hmm? If you want to know yourself as light in the magnitude of a whole universe of light, learn to meditate deeply. But he's not requiring it. It's up to us, right? And it's optional. Cosmic delusion, maya, it's very happy for us to stay here as long as we want. <laughs> so the only person making us do anything on the spiritual path is ourselves. And so when there is a lot going on in our lives, and it seems like I don't have time to meditate, well, it's time to take responsibility, that word again, and determine what are our real priorities. And this is something we all face every single day. We have to choose between all of the other things we have going on in our lives, many of which we like to do and want to do, choose between that and our spiritual routine, which is hard oftentimes, and yet we know it's the only thing that's going to make us really happy in the end. And so to get back this initial enthusiasm we may have felt, when we started the spiritual path, realize that your relationship with this path, with the, your guru, it's just like any other relationship. It takes work, just like a marriage. And this is another of those points Brother Anandamoy makes in that talk on spiritual marriage, that he said most marriages fail from neglect. And it's the same thing with the spiritual path. And so if you want your marriage, your relationship, your spiritual life to work, then it's up to us to keep renewing it. And so what we can do is just take stock of whatever it may be in our life that's keeping us from our spiritual path or from our spiritual routine the most. And I'm not saying we have to reconstruct everything from the bottom up, but just one thing, take one particular thing. Like I was saying about this abundance question, Master said, learn to work for and be content with what you truly need. Maybe we've got all kinds of other things going on and we don't have to do all of them. Try this. I'm not saying you have to, it's up to you. Another concept, another idea, is just to scale back the social engagements. Another idea would be entertainment. 
have your time for entertainment only after you meditate. Turn off the news feeds. I'll get to that a little bit more later. <laughs> but, you know, this is how we can do something positive in this kind of situation when we're overwhelmed by too much and just one change like that, it can be dynamic and change the setting for our whole spiritual path. Now that being said, there are times for every devotee when things come along and there's just no way to have the spiritual routine that we're used to, even no matter how much planning uh, that we've done about, uh, about it. And it happens in the ashram all the time, too. And so when our lives are disrupted this kind of way, you don't just throw out your spiritual routine and say, well, I didn't have time to do the whole thing, so I'm not doing any. There's always time for meditation, if it's even just a little bit. Just do the best you can. And then at the end of the day, when we sit and introspect and talk to the guru, visualize him right there and say, Master, I did my best. I know it wasn't as good as I would have liked, but it was all I could do. And if you can really say that to yourself and to your guru, you're not going to have any feelings of letting either master or yourself down. Okay, moving on. I have a terminal illness, and I know I am in the last phase of my life. I'm at peace, but I'm yearning for a much deeper relationship with Guruji at this time. I want to meditate and practice the techniques, which I believe is essential for me in order to have this relationship with Master, but I have so much physical discomfort and just can't manage. What can I do? Well, I think this is actually a continuation of the answer of do what you can. And of course, death. For all of us, that is the final test of life for every being. And every moment of our lives we live up to that test. But for this particular devotee, this desire for a deeper relationship with the guru, that is giving him or her the means to perfect this ultimate spiritual quality that we were talking about in that relationship question, unconditional love. And it's not so much now a matter of practicing the techniques, but just feeling love and devotion in the heart. And then don't worry about whether your guru is going to be with you when you need him the most. Because one of the promises of this sacred guru-discipleship relationship is that at the time of the disciple's death, the guru is present to usher him or her into the new life in the astral world. And Master talks about this in Man's Eternal Quest. He said, many times when some disciple living far away has been ill or dying, he has drawn my astral body there through his devotion. One such incident happened here. Seva Devi was a very devoted student. She became extremely ill, but she never complained about it to anyone, but she knew her time to come, had come to leave. And that she was in Los Angeles, and Master said sometime later, he was in Encinitas, in the Hermitage, and one morning I suddenly felt intuitively the subtle astral vibration of Seva Devi. She drew my astral body to her through her devotion. My physical body was as dead. 
And I was later told that Seva Devi, just before she passed, she exclaimed, Swamiji is here. They, all the others in the room, were told by her of Master's presence. Master said she was aware of being consciously ushered by me into the other world. And so, as I said, now is the time to focus on those heart qualities. Now, that which is not to say don't meditate, but just meditate as you're able. And don't worry about doing more than you're able to. And so, you can modify the techniques as you may need to. Sister Gyanamada, in her last days, she couldn't stand anymore, but she sat to do the energization exercises. And if you can't even do that, you can practice them mentally, laying down. You can practice all of the techniques laying down, if need be, if you can't sit up. And if you can't do even that, just keep your gaze focused at the spiritual eye. Visualize the guru there and repeat, I love you, Master. I love you, God. I love you, Master. I love you, God. And you have his promise. He will be with you when you need him the most. And now the final question for this morning. I've been having a very difficult time in the face of current domestic and world events. I am filled with anger, fear, sorrow, and even disbelief regarding all that is happening. I pray constantly and realize this is God's play, but I vacillate often, and it is painful. Any suggestions? Well, yes, a number of suggestions for why it is the way it is, which we've already talked about before. The law of reincarnation and karma ensures that we are drawn to an environment where we can work out whatever it was that we didn't get a chance to do previously. So whatever conditions confront me, I know they represent the next step in my unfoldment. And so, for all of us who can relate to this particular question, the lesson for us might be that we really now need to learn unconditional faith in the protection and help and blessing of the gurus. And that there is really nothing to fear because this world is not our home. And if you're finding the world to be upsetting right now, realize it's just doing its job. <laughs> That's what it's supposed to do. Keeping us engaged with the relative pleasures and pains of a delusion that doesn't really exist. It is God's show. Master said... If you are wrapped up in the movies, you can't help but going through the emotions the movies create. And so, another helpful thought, at least for me, is to realize that we have survived countless catastrophes already. How many times have we died before? How many incarnations have we gone through? Master says, millions, according to the Hindu scriptures. And every one of those, we died. And where are we now? We're alive. We're fine. Everything. Look at me. I'm alive. At our London center, the monks have a little kitchen area, and there's a cupboard there with some mugs. And one of those mugs, it has this saying written on it, in the end, everything will be all right. 
Then it goes on. And if it's not all right, it's not the end. (laughs) So just keep this in mind. But this is just still, it's just an intellectual understanding. Let's do something very practical. If we're finding that all that's going on is encroaching on our meditations and these thoughts and worries, they're nibbling at our practice of our techniques, there's something really simple. And this is what I was referring to before. Turn off the news feeds. Just don't listen to it. On your cellular, on your mobile device, take all those news things and just put them into the trash bin. Okay? Uh, I guarantee you, the world is going to keep on without you. (laughs) Just fine. And realize, too, the news that we listen to and read and hear about and all of that, it has to sell to stay in business. And what sells is upsetting. It's built that way. But that's not the real point. The real point is beyond this, maya is selling us cosmic delusion. And we are buying it by allowing ourselves to be upset by it. Okay? And so, if our meditations are being bombarded this kind of way with noise of all these worries, it's time to turn off the physical switch. And of course, I'm not saying if some of us may have a legitimate need, I've got to know what's going on because of uh, my occupation, that sort of thing. Well, that, that's fine, but just turn it down. <laughs> Become dispassionate about the stuff going on out there. But then, beyond that, is in meditation, turn off the switch. And this is what pranayama meditation techniques are all about. Disconnecting consciousness from the noise of sensory input. And to do that, might I suggest, when you sit in Hong Sa, practice Hong Sa. Really? (laughs) Because if you're really focused on the breath, on the chant, those two things, you can't think of anything else. That solves that issue. And then we can go even deeper in our meditations. You know, and I'm not saying this just happens easy and it's quick and I, you know, it's so easy to stand up here and talk about it. It takes a long time and a lot of effort. But in the end, we are going to be able to control the switch of the universe. And I'm coming back as a recapitulation to this quatrain of Omar Khayyam's that we started on. Remember, ah, love, could thou and I with fate conspire to grasp this sorry scheme of things entire? Would not we shatter it to bits and then remold it nearer to the heart's desire? And that's what we're doing as we keep on this spiritual path. Master says in his commentary on this, Thus does every being at times wish he could play the role of creator and make this world more to his heart's desire. This longing for unalloyed happiness springs from the core of the soul. And so, yes, it's a wish for every created being, but as we progress on the spiritual path, even though it seems like it's far-fetched, this is our destiny, to be able to remake it the way we know it ought to be. And then, 
Master says in his commentary again on this quatrain, in the last act, the perfected man beholds the divine playwright and then understands all that has gone on before. God will in time suddenly lift the veil for every ascending soul, disclosing the final part of the cosmic drama, long concealed behind the many acts of tragedies and comedies, to reveal its mighty, noble end. We are still in the middle of the novel. And so what the spiritual path is all about, it's turning bad movie scripts that we have written ourselves into beautiful ones. And that's what we're doing as we go along this path. And as I say, it's not quick, it's not easy, but keep it up. Because in the end, we will be able to dissolve the show into its constituent components of light, revealing ourselves as light in the magnitude of a whole universe of light. Okay? Jai Guru, have a wonderful continuation with your convocation.